God is good? All the time. Okay, now the answer is all the time. All the time. All right, so God is good? All the time. And all the time. God is good. God is good? All the time. And all the time. God is good. You know, it's funny that that has been with us for so long, and it's become kind of a, I guess kind of a logo or more like a verbal logo for us at Word of Hope. And it started back when I first heard an arrangement of that song called God is Good by Don Moen. Been around as a Christian singer, songwriter, worship leader for many, many years, still is. But when that came out, it just kind of connected with me. And it's kind of a toe tapper, you know, you kind of just start find yourself going, slapping your knee, and, and God is good all the time. and all. It's just a great song. And to hear that and just now to know that just He is just, He's just good all the time. And I'm so glad because we're not. We want to be. We try to be. But we're just not. We're not perfect. And so I'm just so excited about that. Well, it is a joy to be with you. It is an honor especially to come and share the Word of God with you today. This is not an easy thing for a pastor to step down for a moment because of health or whatever. Take a sabbatical. Take a break in this case to have a procedure done and turn the pulpit over to somebody else. That's not an easy thing to do, guys and gals. And so I am honored that God would, would work through your elders, work through Brother Rick to allow this opportunity. The message I want to share with you today is actually the same message that I'm sharing via video to our church. It's in a sermon series called The Mighty Power of God. So I was searching all week long, and I was, I was kind of texting back and forth to Brother Rick. I said, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. And I'm like, okay. And the Lord's like, ask me. And I'm like, hey, there's a great thought. Let's ask the Lord. What do you want? And then sometimes when you ask, you're like, okay, um, it's Wednesday. I need to let Brother Tim know <laughs> so he can test it out and see if the PowerPoint's going to work. It's Thursday, and it's like, okay, Lord, I know you're never late. You're always on time. Now? And, and it's funny because I had like three different things that have been gelling for the last couple of days, and then all of a sudden he said, you've already got it. You ever, you ever hear the Lord say that or kind of confirm you? You've already got it. I've already given it to you. Where is it? It's right in front of you. Okay. So as I was thinking about that, I was getting our video ready to go today because our, our congregation is still not meeting yet. I was thinking, is that it? Yes, you got it. Don't you love it when God gives you that confirmation? You've been searching around, kind of chasing your tail for a few days. It's like it was there all along. So I'm going to have the privilege today uh, to be here with you. I'm so excited my wife Jeannie could be here and we could come up and be with you. So we're going to share with you a message that is actually part two in this series called The Mighty Power of God, but it's titled Sodom and Gomorrah, Are You Living There? Actually, I thought of it on the way up there should be a different title, so I was thinking about going back and editing it. You could say maybe in the, in the smaller print, four words, I can handle it. And the, the part that comes after that is, can you? We'll see in just a minute. But we're going to talk about that because here you've got two amazing cities. We've heard about them a lot. Scripture says that they were destroyed. Is that true? Is, is everything that went on there true? And maybe more importantly, when you look at something like this, the takeaway is, what does that mean to me? Okay, Sodom and Gomorrah is not known for really great things, so why would I want to hear that today? What message could I possibly have that's going to connect with me? I got something cool. I think the Lord's just going to talk to you just like He talked to me, and I hope it just pricks your heart, because that's really, that's one of the things I love about what Brother Rick preaches. He always gives you takeaways, things you can take when you walk out the door to apply to your lives to live. That's what I, lo that's what I long for when I come to church. And so I hope that the Lord's going to just share with you today what can we learn and why is that important in my life about Sodom and Gomorrah and more importantly answering the question, are you living there? I'll get to more of that in a minute, but let's pray. Father, thank you for your kindness, your goodness, your amazing love. Thank you for your word, which is ever true. Father, help us to understand everything that you want us to know today about this story that we're going to tell. Not just that it's factual or what all the details were, but why we need to hear it today. Tell us all of that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You know, just like today, back in the 1690s, Jamaica was an island paradise. Now, there are palm trees, tropical breezes, beautiful beaches. Anybody ever been there? Amen. You know it's true. You know, wealthy people used to seek it out to go there and, and stay. They would build huge mansions. 
And they did that in a town called Port Royal. Now, Port Royal was not a tourist trap. What Port Royal was known for, it was called the wickedest city on the earth. It was a den of pirates and prostitutes and slavers. It was unlike anything the world had ever known. But then in 1692, God came down and he brought judgment on this town called Port Royal. In the space of less than 10 minutes, this thriving seaport was shaken by three earthquakes. The last one registered 7.6 on the Richter scale, and then a tsunami came, and the entire city sank into the Caribbean, never to rise again. An eyewitness account of the scene said this, quote, The earth heaved and swelled like the rolling billows, and in many places the earth cracked open, opened and shut with a motion quick and fast. In some of these cases, people were swallowed up, others were caught up in the middle and pressed to death. The whole was attended with a noise of falling mountains at a distance, while the sky was turned dull and reddish like a glowing oven. The account goes on to say, the city's population was approximately 6,500 at the time, but when those moments came, those earthquakes and tsunamis came, 2,000 died. And then because of the lack of shelter and clean water, another 3,000 died after that. If you do the math, not many survived. The people of Jamaica were so shaken by what took place, they were so convinced that this was the hand of God that destroyed this city that a religious revival swept across the land. And they outlawed piracy. To this day, the article said, many Jamaicans believe that Port Royal's destruction was the price exacted by an angry God for its sins. Mm -hmm. Now some have called Port Royal the 17th century Sodom. I've read where others refer to it as the Sodom of the West. Why would they call that city Sodom? Well, I think it's kind of obvious when you listen to the story because Port Royal's sinfulness and destruction sounds a lot like the Bible account of Sodom. In the Bible, Sodom is synonymous with wickedness and judgment. The prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 13, 19, Babylon, the most glorious of kingdoms, the flower of Chaldean pride, will be devastated like Sodom and Gomorrah when God destroyed them. Then in Jude 7, it declares, And don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and served as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. Peter agreed, in fact, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, we're told God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. And again, in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verses 28 and 29, Jesus said that his coming would be like the world as it was in the days of Lot. People went about their daily business, eating and drinking, buying and selling, farming and building, until the morning, Lot left Sodom. The fire and burning sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. You know, besides the account in the book of Genesis, Sodom is mentioned 26 other times throughout Scripture, and it's always spoken of as a place that has existed and stood for God's judgment. Now, we're going to be in Genesis 19 today. We're going to be going in and around that, but that's going to be the center point. So if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, you might want to open and start moving your way towards Genesis. If you're not sure where it is, you never know. Just open your Bible, go left all the way to the top of the street, and you'll find Genesis, okay? Chapter 19. Now, the question that I asked earlier, did Sodom and Gomorrah actually exist? Were they actually destroyed as Genesis describes? For a long time, there were skeptics that would say, Nah, I don't think so. I don't really think that happened. But they don't say that anymore. You see, back in the 1960s, archaeologists found the ruins of a major city that is called Elba. Over 4,000 years ago, Elba was a major merchant center, and the population had more than a quarter million people. Big city. Archaeologists who were working in the area found tablets that were written 800 years before Moses. And they were written in a language very much like ancient Hebrew. And on those tablets were names like Gaza, Joppa, Damascus, Sodom, and Gomorrah. Now today, nobody questions whether or not these cities existed because they were discovered that the ruins of these cities lay along a major trade route, which you've probably heard in Bible times called the King's Highway. Now... Up until a few days ago, the scholars thought that 
these cities were underneath the Dead Sea. Maybe you've read that. There was a large push, in fact, many years ago, saying that they were under the Dead Sea. But more recently, they believe that the remains of those cities are found to the west and south of the Dead Sea. I was reading not long ago about certain archaeologists who say they found strong evidence that these cities were destroyed. And they stated that the evidence was from radiocarbon dating. Now, I don't know much about that, so I had to go back and read a little bit about how they do that. But according to this radiocarbon dating, they found that there was a group that flourished in that area about 2,000 years, approximately 1700 B.C. would be the time. And they found that the mud brick walls of the civilization had been destroyed. Only the, sound, the uh, stone foundations remained, but everything else had been destroyed. At the same time, they found that pottery in the settlements was heated into glass in the space of milliseconds, according to the results of zircon crystals that were found in the process. What does that mean? It means that, that there was so much heat that was generated in the destruction of that city. Here's the temperature zone, from 7,232 degrees Fahrenheit to 21,632 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the window. That is the comparable temperature to the surface of the sun, which is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the kind of heat that was thrust into this area. Researchers estimate that approximately 40 to 60,000 people that were living in the region were killed and a 500 square kilometer area was rendered uninhabitable for between six and 700 years. They believe that that area was stripped of its topsoil and the salty deposits came from the Dead Sea that was nearby. And they were spread all over the land and of course that made it infertile. So what does the Bible say? The Bible records that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by, as we just read, fire and burning sulfur. Another translation of that in your Bibles might be brimstone. You've heard the term fire and brimstone. Fire and sulfur, very similar. The Hebrew word for sulfur is gophrith. So throughout Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur is found embedded in the ground. It's highly flammable, and when it does ignite, it produces a gas called sulfur dioxide, or SO2. Now, there's only one area in the world where sulfur stones are found, Sodom and Gomorrah. Sulfur is found elsewhere, and it rarely exceeds 40% purity, but in Sodom, the sulfur content is 96% pure. That's something to listen. So Sodom and Gomorrah did exist. Yes, God destroyed them. But the real question that I know you're waiting for the answer for is, why is that important to me? Why is that important for us? What can we learn from that? Well, there's one really obvious lesson, and Brother Rick, I thought of you as soon as I came, this came to my mind. You really don't want to tick off God. <laughs> I think that's an obvious lesson there. Now, there are people who talk a lot about God being a God of love, and it, He wouldn't do something like that, and they'd be right. God is a loving God. John 3 and 16 says, For this is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son. Amen, right? He loved us so much that he was willing to offer a precious sacrifice, his son, so that our lives would be changed forever. But God is also a God who despises evil, and when push comes to shove, my friends, he has and he will destroy those who go too far. There's no question about it. You know, I can remember several years ago saying to a, a close friend of mine, man, if you weren't my brother in Christ, man, I'd have nothing to do with you. Now, I can't remember exactly what the moment was that caused me to think like that, but what I'm trying to tell him in that conversation was essentially, man, stop pushing me. Anybody ever have that moment? No, probably not, okay? But anyway, so the first lesson is you really don't want to take off God. But for most people, that's not an issue. I mean, we don't wake up in the morning thinking, well, gee, I wonder how I can tick God off today. You know, I mean, that's not what we do. Most people, instead, we sort of back into sin. Think about this. Instead, we, we, we don't start out thinking about evil. We don't try to be evil. We just sort of hang around evil people, evil circumstances, and that begins to change us. For example, do you know how Lot ended up in Sodom? Many of us think he just was there. You'd think that he would know that was a wicked city. Well... In fact, the angels came to town, and when they did, what did Lot do? He insisted that they stay at his house that night. Why? Because he knew that that was an evil city. He knew what the Sodomites were going to do if they got their hands on these men. 
And so he ended up bringing them to his house. What was, what was Lot doing in Sodom to begin with? Go back a little bit to Genesis 13. All right? Genesis 13, verses 8 and 9. Because here in Genesis 13, Lot and his uncle Abraham were tending their flocks not far from the city. Their herdsmen weren't getting along really well. So Abraham looked at the situation and he says to Lot in verses 8 and 9 of Genesis 13, Let's not allow this conflict to come between us or our herdsmen. After all, we're close relatives. The whole countryside is open to you. Take your choice of any section of land you want and we'll separate. If you want the land to the left, then I'll take the land to the right. If you prefer the land on the right, then I'll take the land on the left. And then in verses 10 and 11 it says, Lot took a long look at the fertile plains of the Jordan Valley in the direction of Zoar. The whole area was well watered everywhere, like the Garden of the Lord, or the beautiful land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot chose for himself the whole Jordan Valley to the east of them. He went there with his flocks and servants and parted company with his uncle Abram. So Abram settled in the land of Canaan. And Lot moved his tents to a place near Sodom and settled among the cities of the plain. So that tells you that Lot moved his tent near Sodom. He wasn't actually in the city, but he was really close. But again, I'll ask you, why? Why would he do that? Why did he move near a city that he knew was evil? Probably because it looked really good. It looked like the Garden of Eden. But in the next chapter... We read that Lot has moved again. Go to Genesis 14, verse 12. It says in that verse, Abram's nephew, which means Lot, lived where? In Sodom. So he'd been living near the city. Now he is in the city of Sodom. But wait, it gets even better than that. In Genesis 19, our text this morning, starting with verse 1, we're told that that evening the two angels came to the entrance of the city and Lot was sitting there. Did you catch that? Where was Lot sitting? He was sitting at the gate to the city. Why was he sitting at the gate of the city? Well, in ancient times, there was nothing like a courthouse that was in town. If you had a dispute with your neighbor or you had some other issue, you would take your case to the men at the gate because that's where the men of the gate were. They were wise men. He was an honored member of the community, folks. People respected his judgment. So Lot starts out living outside of Sodom. Then he moves closer to the city. And now he's inside of Sodom. And he's one of their leading citizens of one of the most evil cities on the planet. Why would he do that? I believe you can sum the answer up in four words. I can handle it. I think Lot believed Sodom was not going to affect him. I believed he thought he was too righteous to be changed by that evil city. But could he? Could he handle Sodom? Well, let's think about that. When the Sodomites came to his door demanding to sleep with his visitors, Lot said in Genesis 19:8, Look, I have two virgin daughters. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do with them as you wish. But please leave these men alone, for they are my guests and under my protection. Again, do you hear that? You heard it right. It's unbelievable. Lot offers up his daughters to give to these guys to have sex with them while he protects the two men, these angels, in his home. Who would do that? What kind of person does that? What kind of dad and father does that? Seriously. I mean, it doesn't sound right to me. I hope if I was in that circumstance, I would have answered correctly, which would have been, see ya. Yeah. You know? But apparently it sounded right to Lot. When you are not in your right frame of mind, things that we know are irrational sound very good. But why would he do this? Because he lived in Sodom. That's why. And that's the kind of thing Sodomites do. Lot thought he could handle it. How many of us get in a situation that's bad, that's evil, and we think we can handle it? We think we're good enough. We think we're strong enough in our walk to handle it. Living in Sodom changed him. God said in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. You might want to write that down. That's a scripture I wrote down after this sermon because I need to be reminded of that. Lot couldn't handle it. How about his family? The text tells that the angels are, are rushing them out of the city. 
And they told Lot what, not what to do. Not, don't look back. Don't have any of your family members look back. But Lot's wife didn't listen. And she never left town. And then there's Lot's daughters. Verse 19. So Lot rushed out to tell his daughter's fiancé. So obviously they were married. Can you believe that? Engaged daughters he was going to offer to these guys. Anyway, he says, So Lot rushed out to tell his daughter's fiancé, Quick, get out of the city. The Lord's about to destroy it. But the young men, what did they do? They thought he was joking. They didn't believe it. What happened to those future son-in-laws? They died. Why didn't the angels try to convince these young men to leave the city? That's an interesting question. Because they were as wicked as everybody else in Sodom. So in effect, Lot was allowing his daughters to marry these two evil men. They're wicked. They're from the city. Crazy, right? How many Christians do you know that can say, I can handle it? I can handle the alcohol or the drugs. I can handle the R-rated movies or the pornography. I can handle being surrounded by cursing and foul mouths. I can handle it. I can handle it. I can handle it. You name it. I can handle it. They know that what they're doing is probably not something that they'd want Jesus to catch them doing. They think it won't affect them. Eh, maybe they're right. But what about their kids and their grandkids and their nieces and their nephews? You might start out pure as a driven snow, folks. And just a little dirty, maybe. And you might say, well, I'll only go this far. I'm not going to go any farther. I'm just going to compromise and go this far. Those young ones, they're watching. They're going to look up to you. And they're going to use that little farther as their baseline. That's where they're going to begin. And when you stopped, they're going to continue. Because they think it's normal. Mm -hmm. One of the lessons of Sodom is... You are who you associate with. Have you ever heard that phrase? Mm -hmm. It's so true. You hang around sinful atmospheres. You hang around sinful people. And it's going to affect you. Believe it or not. You're going to begin to compromise. You're going to be letting your guard down. You'll begin to accept behavior that you know lovingly is not what God would have you do. And if you leave it unchecked, it can and it will destroy your life. Mm -hmm. One last thought for you. What do you do if you love someone and they live in Sodom? What do you do if they've allowed themselves to live too long in this evil world? You know they're hurting themselves. You know it's harming their families. And you know they're headed for destruction. And if they don't make a change, they're going to go to hell. You feel helpless. What can I say? What can I do? Is there anything we can do? There's one more part of the story. To that, you have to turn back to Genesis 18. Before God sent his angels to destroy the city of Sodom, he paid Abraham a visit. And God told Abraham what he had in mind. We're going to be in Genesis 18, around verse 23. Do you remember what Abraham did? He bargained with God. It says in Genesis 18, starting with verse 23 through 24, Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away both the righteous and the wicked? Suppose you find 50 righteous people living there in the city. Will you still sweep it away and not spare it for their sakes? That's bargaining with God, folks. And God said he'd spare the city if there were 50 righteous people in it. Now, why would Abraham ask God that? Why ask if God would spare the city if he found only 50 righteous people? Because God knew Lot lived in that city and he wanted to save him. But he also knew Sodom was wicked, and so Abraham bargained some more. Look at verses 28 to 32. Suppose there are only 45 righteous people rather than 50. Will you destroy the whole city for a lack of five? And the Lord said... I will not destroy it if I find 45 righteous people there. When Abraham pressed his request further, suppose there are only 40. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy it for the sake of the 40. Please don't be angry, my Lord, Abraham pleaded. Let me speak. Suppose only 30 righteous people are found. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy it if I find 30. In verse 31, Abraham said, Since I have dared to speak to the Lord, let me continue. Suppose there are only 20. And the Lord replied that I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. Finally, Abraham said, Lord, please don't be angry with me if I speak one more time. Suppose only 10 are found. 
And the Lord replied, Then I will not destroy it for the sake of the ten. God knew there weren't even ten people in that entire city that were righteous. But you know what? God knew it was important to Abraham. And for the sake of Abraham and his prayer, God did what he could to save Lot and his family. Now one observation here. Who did God send to Sodom to rescue Lot and his family? Angels. The Bible teaches that when we pray, God sends angels to work on our prayers. Daniel 9, Daniel 10. Hebrews 1.14 says, Therefore, angels are only servants, spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. Folks, when we pray, we unleash the powers of heaven. Amen. Mm -hmm. Be aware, no matter what we pray, God will not ignore the free will of those we pray for. It's important to understand that. If we choose to ignore God, if they choose to ignore God, our loved ones are going to do so at their, at their own risk, just like Lot's wife experienced. But our prayers are mighty. And they make it so that even the most difficult of our loved ones can still feel their impact. Prayer is our most powerful tool. Can you say that with me? Prayer, Prayer is our is most powerful, powerful tool. tool. We often leave it for the last thing. Why? Because we're not involved in doing anything. We feel we need to be physically, emotionally, intellectually engaged in all aspects in order to be accomplishing something when in fact all we need to do is pray with a sincere heart. That is the greatest offensive weapon we have. It's a great defensive weapon too. It's the most powerful tool we have in our toolbox. I know many of you have toolboxes. <laughs> There's lots of things we have in our shops and they're powerful. You hit a hammer hard enough, it can do some damage. You have saws and all kinds of things. But why don't we not think of prayer as that powerful or more? Prayer unleashes the power of heaven. So we should always pray to God for Him to save your loved ones and work in their lives. If you know someone that's living in Sodom, they probably think, I can handle it. We know they can't. And maybe we know from because we've been there too. Time to pray. Time to act as the Lord will lead. As Jesus taught, we should always pray and never, ever, ever give up. Let's pray. Father, we give you honor and glory and majesty for all of this. Lord, there are people, I know in my mind right now, there may be for the rest of us today too, where we know someone who's living inside him. Someone who thinks they can handle it. Someone who is being broken down little by little and becoming corrupted by the evil that surrounds them. Father, we pray for that person right now. In the mighty and most powerful name there is, your name. We're asking you to intervene. As Abraham asked you, Lord, will you save him? Will you? You showed us in that story you did. You saved Lot's life, but some did not go. His wife didn't listen. The son and potential son-in-laws didn't listen. And sadly, there's going to be other folks that won't listen to you. But let us not grow weary of praying. Let us not grow weary of doing what we know we have to, to intercede consistently on their behalf. Thank you that you always listen. May we take this encouragement that we receive from your word today and realize that prayer is the most powerful weapon we have. Thank you for loving us and allowing us to use it. In your name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.